Okay, good morning, everybody. I'd like you to turn, please, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 26, and we're going to read down into chapter 2 to the end of the chapter, so chapter 2, verse 10, and we're going to be considering both the throne and the call, the call of the prophet, and of course, what a place to get a call uh, from the very throne of God. So that's what we're going to consider. And so verse 26 It says this, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber and as the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins even upward And from the appearance of his loins, even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about it. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me, They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impotent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, for they shall say unto them, thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, and they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So we want to just, as it were, conclude this vision of chapter one. Remember, it was the throne chariot uh, we saw underneath with the, these cherubim and the wheels. And then, of course, you had this firmament, this platform, this thinly spread out uh, topping of the, the chariot throne. And now the last piece, as it were, of this vision is the actual throne and the one who is seated upon it. And so we see it mentioned here in verse 26, above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above upon it. So it begins by describing the color of this divine throne. And he says it was as the color uh, of a sapphire stone, or it was the uh, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. Now, again, we, we see that connected with visions of God in the book of Exodus. If we go back there just for a moment, in Exodus chapter 24, Exodus 24, verses 9 and 10, and we'll notice that similar idea here. It says, And then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they it says they saw the God of Israel, 
and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. So we do have a connection with the presence of God and the a vision of God, this reference to the sapphire stone again. And of course, the sapphire stone is blue in color. And so the heavenly throne is blue. Some say more properly, it's lapis lazuli, which is an azure blue stone prized since ancient times. So that's, uh, by the way, it's one of my favorite colors, not because of the connection here, but I just actually love that azure kind of blue color. But anyway, that is the the, the color of the divine throne. It's cut and polished this, this, this particular stone for ornamental purposes. So a very, very beautiful color of the stone. And of course, then uh, we see that this throne, it's an occupied throne. There's one seated upon it. The, what we call the director of the chariot throne, the one who is riding this throne through the heavens. Uh, and so we get a little glimpse of the one who is occupying the throne. On this blue throne, uh, it says he saw this appearance of a man upon the throne. And it's agreed by most Bible expositors that this anticipates the incarnation, what we might call a Christophany, an Old Testament revelation of the eternal son who ever lived in the bosom of the father so it's it's what we call this christophany it's anticipating the incarnation one who shared his glory who would take on humanity and what's interesting is that now if we were to see that same throne it wouldn't be the appearance of a man seated on that throne but actually there is a real man seated on that throne <laughs> the one who came and took on humanity permanently is now seated on the throne of the universe and it's just amazing to think no longer an appearance it really is a man seated on the throne what a wonderful thought that is the description suggests that ezekiel did not see a face and a body that he could have drawn but rather a fiery brightness that had a human shape and that we knew that he knew to be a living and personal appearance. So that's why he uses this language. The appearance, uh, he says, uh, of a man above upon it. And he describes it. I saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upwards, and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness about it. Of course, we know from Scripture that our God is a consuming fire <laughs> first revelation to moses of who sent you is i am and of course it's this bush that is burning without ever running out of fuel and so that's the idea of this consuming energy of god that is being conveyed and of course his absolute holiness burning holiness a fire often connected with holiness god being a consuming fire now, notice he talks about the color as well, the color of amber. And again, I just want you to notice this is a fourth reference to color we've seen. We, we saw beryl or emerald green that was coming out from the wheels, uh, then clear crystal of the firmament, and then sapphire blue, and now golden brown amber color that is the final color. And again, all we're saying is this, that all these colors, what they're telling us is this, there's nothing dull or boring about God. Beautiful colors exude from the very throne of God. And of course, very important to understand this. So the appearance of fire, as we said, is emphasizing his infinite holiness. Notice verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. So one last piece that he sees is this appearance like a bow surrounding the throne. Very interesting. Because uh, this God of majesty and power is also a God of promise and grace. Remember that first reference to the bow that he set in the cloud goes back to Genesis, doesn't it? That I'm not going to destroy the earth uh, again with a flood. And so the bow shows that there's a sympathetic man who is seated on the throne. And even though his mission is one of judgment, 
he's always mindful of uh, his covenant promises to those who are what we consider to be the faithful remnant. So he is faithful to his covenant promises. Now, what's interesting concerning this vision is Noah, he saw the bull after the storm. So this bull came to him in vision after the flood had occurred. He saw it after the storm. The Apostle John in the book of Revelation, remember that surrounding the throne in Revelation, there's also a circled uh, rainbow uh, in, in green, which is interesting. And he saw the, the bull, John saw it, before the storm, before the the seals were opened and the judgments began. So Noah sees it after the storm. Uh, Moses, oh, oh, sorry, Apostle John sees it before the storm. When we come to Ezekiel, he sees it over the storm. Because remember what he's the first vision he saw is this thunder, this lightning uh, coming uh, from the north. And so he actually sees it over the storm and in control of the storm. So what we could say is this, that although the mission of the throne at this moment is judgment, but we can detect from seeing the bow surrounding the throne that in judgment, he is yet going to remember mercy. And of course, that reminds us of the prophet Habakkuk, uh, where he refers to uh, just a beautiful verse in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. He says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the year. In the midst of the years, make known. And then he says this, in wrath, remember mercy. And so that's the, the idea that's being conveyed. Yes, this is a mission of judgment. But in, in wrath, God indeed will remember mercy. And so it's good to be reminded of that. He makes it clear to us exactly what he saw. Notice he says again in verse 28, the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, and so was the appearance of the brightness round about. And then he says this, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. I heard a voice of one that spake. So as he puts the whole vision together, he comes up with this conclusion that he has been given a vision of the glory of the Lord. Now, what's so remarkable about this, and it really is a remarkable thing, and in fact, he's going to mention the glory of the Lord 16 times in his book. And, and maybe we'll just take a minute to look at the references, and then we're going to see wh why this is so significant. So we see it here in 128 where the glory of the Lord is mentioned. But we're also going to see it again in chapter 3, and down in verse 12, it says, The Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. And so as he's about to commence his ministry, he's reminded again of the glory of the Lord, uh, right at the very commencement of his ministry. In chapter uh, 3 again, and verse 23, then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there as the glory which I saw by the river of Kiba, and I fell on my face. And so once more, he's seeing this vision of the glory of the Lord, and he does the same thing. He falls on his face when he sees it. Chapter 8 now, please, and verse 4. He says, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. So once again, he gets another glimpse of the glory of the Lord. Chapter 9, verse 3, And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had a writer's ink on by his side. Chapter 10, verse 4, then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with a cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Verse 18 of chapter 10. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. 
Uh, verse 19, the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight, and then they went out. Wheels also were beside them, and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. So again, once more, another glimpse of the glory of the Lord. Chapter 11, verse 22 and 23. Again, then did the cherubim lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. That would be the Mount of Olives. It's left the, the temple, moved to the Mount of Olives. Don't see the glory of the Lord mentioned again now until we get to chapter 39. A long gap. Of course, this long gap is talking about the judgment of the nations. But in chapter 39, verse 21, he says this, And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid hold upon them. So that's 39, 21. 43 and verse 2. This is the return of the glory of the Lord to the temple where he says, verse 2, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. So twice it's mentioned there. The glory of the God of Israel, and then the earth shined with his glory. And then verse 4 and 5, The glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me to the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And then final reference to the glory of the Lord in chapter 44, verse 4, And brought he me the way of the north gate before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my face. Notice his reaction is pretty much consistent that when he personally sees the glory of the Lord, he always hits the deck and falls on his face. But I just, of course, that kind of gives you the whole book of Ezekiel in a nutshell, right? It's the, 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 the Ichabod, the glory departing in the first 11 chapters because of their exchanging the glory of God and worshiping the created thing rather than the creator. God can't stay. He leaves. But then as a result of his divine grace, he puts everything right, and then the glory of the Lord is restored to Ezekiel's temple in the last days. And so that's kind of the picture of the book. And that's why we talk about Ezekiel as the prophet of the glory of the Lord, because he mentions it so many times. As we said, 16 occurrences of the glory of the Lord. So why is this so amazing? First of all, this Ezekiel must have been absolutely astonished at such a vision, since all his tradition— and all his training in the priestly office would have led him to expect that the glory of the God of Israel would be hidden behind the veil in the most holy place. The last place that he expected to see the glory of the Lord was in amongst the nations, the Gentile nations, uh, in Babylon, Ur of the Chaldees, in this, this area, that last place he expected to see a vision of the glory of, of the God of Israel. He thought it would be hidden away. So seeing it in a strange land and moving in the world as a whole was a remarkable vision for him. And we said he's seen this theophany or Christophany as God had appeared to him in a visionary form. And, of course, he uses the term appearance and likeness because he's pointing out that he had not seen God. He saw the likeness of the glory of God, the God of Israel. Because if he'd have seen God face to face, he would have been consumed. Because what do we say? Nobody can see that directly. Ezekiel, uh, Exodus 33, uh, just a couple of references, would tell us that uh, he saw the appearance of, but not directly. Uh Ezekiel, uh, sorry, Exodus 33, verse 18, we read this, it says, he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. 
And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and because he stands in the rock. But then verse 23, I will take away mine hand, thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And then, of course, we see the very same thing in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So what he saw was this appearance. And that's why he's so careful in using the likeness, the appearance, because if he had seen the face of God directly, he would have been consumed. So God revealed this magnificent person to Ezekiel in sense of this appearance of his glory to prepare him for ministry. Now, why does he need to see this? Because it really is Romans one twenty three, he, And of course, he's going to pronounce judgment on this people. And he has to understand what they have rejected and what they have exchanged. He has to see it uh, firsthand to be able to comprehend the significance of the, the sin of the nation. In Romans 1, 23, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. This is the sin of the nation of Judah. They have made a deliberate exchange. Rather than be consumed with the glory of the Lord, they're actually worshipping the created things rather than him. So, so this is why God can't stay. This is why he has to, as it were, purge the land and, and deal with them. And so this vision of the glory of God, who is seen as the sovereign God of all the earth, exercising judgment according to knowledge and giving to his prophet the assurance of absolute authority, and, of course, his response is just like the response of John on the Isle of Patmos. I fell upon my face, and I heard the voice of one that spake. So when we get to chapter 2, we find our prophet with his face in the dust. <laughs> He's down in the dust. Of course, this is, this is where God can use a man, a man that is humbled and down low like this. This is the kind of man. God says, I can use. Uh, I remember I've said this many times, but one of the reasons God used D.L. Moody so greatly was that he had never heard of himself. It was his humility that meant God could use him. And God only ever uses little men who are small in their own eyes, who recognize the greatness and the glory of God and their own insignificance. God can take a man and use a man like that. And so when we get to chapter 2, I'm going to give you a little outline, very simple outline, really. But in verse 1 and 2, we have the prophet is strengthened because he, he's just seen this vision. And he's actually right in the dust. And so God is going to strengthen his servant. Verses 3 through 5, this prophet is sent. We're going to see God is going to be sending him. He said unto me, son of man, verse 3, I send thee. So the prophet is sent. Prophet is strengthened. Verses 1 and 2, prophet is sent. Verse 6 and 7, the prophet is to shun fear. Thou, son of man, be not afraid of them. If we're going to serve the Lord, we cannot cower down with fear. Right, we we uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? So this is to serve the Lord. We we can't have fear. So he's to shun fear, and then verse eight through ten, the prophet is to savor the message, and so he's to he's to take it in, eat what I give you. He's got to make it his own before he delivers it to somebody else. He has to make it his own. He has to savor the message. So very simple in a sense as we consider Ezekiel's commission and call, having been given a vision of the glory of God, there's now a purpose. God has a purpose. God does not give visions of his glory without a true purpose behind it. The man who has seen God's glory is a man with a potent and telling message to give. You see, he can preach to these people. You, you have made a terrible 
error in turning away from the glory of God and and going into idolatry because he's seen it himself. He's got a glimpse of the glory. He realizes what a what a bad exchange they've made, and so uh, he's seen this vision of the glory of God, and so of course it's very significant that he sees that before he's given this call, and so he says to me, "Son of man." Stand upon thy feet, and I will speak to thee. So he's on his face, down in the dust, seen a glimpse of the glory of God, humbled and now in a place of usefulness. Man, of course, needs to remember his dust. And, of course, um, to keep him reminded of the fact that he's dust, he's called son of man, son of Adam. Now, of course, when we think of son of man, the first man was made from what? The dust of the ground, right? God, you know, took the clay and made, you know, made man out of it. So he's never going to be able to forget. Ninety times, God is going to refer to him in this prophecy as Son of Man. Right? Don't ever forget who I am. He's going to be given these constant visions of the glory of God, as we saw 16 times. Never forget who I am. And by the way, Ezekiel, don't ever forget who you are. You're just a man of dust. Don't get too big for your own boots, Ezekiel, right? Remember who you are. But it's, it's good for us to remember who we are, right? We're just dust. We talked before in our preamble discussions about the best of men are men at best, don't forget who you are <laughs> and don't forget who he is. You're going to be used of God. You've got to get those two things clear in your mind. And so he's reminded of the fact that he's, he's just a son of Adam, a son of man. Now, it's interesting, too, that another prophet in the Old Testament, a contemporary, uh, is also called son of man, although only once. And that is Daniel in Daniel 8. And verse 7, we, sorry, 8 verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. So again, we find Daniel on his face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. So again, this term is used also just once of Daniel the prophet. When we come to the New Testament, the Lord Jesus takes up this phrase and applies it to himself. Of course, what marks out the Lord Jesus? You talk about great humility. The one who sat on the throne, the one we saw in chapter 1, who comes down so low and takes upon him, as it were, humanity takes upon him this body made of clay, as it were. And so he takes up that term, he uses it and applies it to himself, his favorite designation, in the sense that he uses it, the Lord Jesus, of himself more frequently than any other designation. Eighty-six times in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus will refer to himself as son of Adam, son of man. Amazing. And, of course, if you want an example of it, one we're all very familiar with, a, a lovely verse in Luke's Gospel, of course, emphasizing particularly uh, his humanity. But Luke 19 and verse 10, we read this, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. In order to accomplish our redemption, he had to become the Son of Man so that we through faith in him, can become sons of God through faith. Isn't that amazing that he had to become son of man so that we could become sons of God through faith? So, by the way, that term son of man does have messianic connotations. We don't ever want to forget that, that it does have messianic connotations in the sense that this, it's, it's always been God's intent that dominion would be given to man. That was ever God's intention. Uh, a man will reign as God's representative on this earth. The last Adam, the second man, is the one who is going to reign as Messiah on the earth for God. 
the first man <laughs> and the first Adam, he failed miserably. The second man, the last Adam, will succeed marvelously. So the one who in the New Testament designates himself to be the son of man also reveals himself in Scripture to be the son of God, none other than the Lord from heaven. And, of course, we see these blessed uh, two natures in one person, indivisible, both Son of God and Son of Man. So, Son of Man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. He says, stand on your feet. Having learned of his own frailty as Son of Man, he must now learn there's a dignity attached to the service of God. And that God is going to give him a standing outside of himself. Stand up. <laughs> and of course, he's going to get his marching orders. Stand to attention. Get your get your marching orders. And so same thing happens with Daniel, the Apostle Paul down in the dust. Uh, he He's told as well uh, to stand up and God is going to uh, give him his commission. So uh, we'll, we'll just take a quick look at Acts 26. Verse 16, it says, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. That's Acts 26, 16, speaking of Paul. Stand up, I've got a message for you to deliver. And so the very same thought here. Um, because... Um, Standing in the presence of God is a very interesting idea. Standing before God, ready to get your commission. Uh, Angel Gabriel, when he appears in Luke one nineteen, says, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. <laughs> so a messenger who's been in the divine presence, received his commission, is now about to deliver it. So the dignity, in a sense, attached to the service of God and demands that we uh, appropriately behave ourselves as those that are called to deliver a message for God. There's no room in the service of God for a slipshod manner or careless attitude. Stand up, get your orders. And so it says, uh, stand on your feet, I will speak unto thee. And verse two, it says, and the spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me. So stand to attention He's about to receive his commission or marching orders from the heavenly commanding officer. Having heard the command to stand, the prophet finds that God gives the ability to do this by the power of the Spirit. God's word, so I'm going to speak to thee, and the Spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me. So it's kind of interesting how God's word and God's spirit are always closely connected to each other. So we, we find in Ephesians 5.18, he says, be filled with the spirit. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Spirit and the word, uh, kind of same uh, results in both cases. And so they're always closely connected together. God's word by God's spirit was the instrument used to strengthen the prophet. Remember, Ezekiel's name means God strengthens. That's the meaning of his name. And of course, how is God going to strengthen his servant? How is God going to strengthen any servant, especially in rebellious days? How is God going to strengthen any servant? By his spirit and by his word. Those two things are going to be significant. So, this is the first recorded incident of many where God will literally fulfill the meaning of Ezekiel's, Ezekiel's name uh, for him. God is going to, through the Spirit, strengthen him. And the thought is this, God does not call his servants and then leave them to their own resources. Okay, He always provides the necessary resources, the Spirit and the Word, two necessary resources in order to serve him. And so on many occasions, the spirit would lift him up. I'll give you examples. We've got here, the spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me and set me on my feet. That's chapter two, verse two, chapter three, verse 14. 
It says, the spirit lifted me up, took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heart of my spirit, in the heat of my spirit, by the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Chapter 8, verse 3. It says, he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of mine head, and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. Chapter 11, verse 1. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house. 11.24. Afterwards, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God to Chaldea, to them of the captivity. Chapter 37. Ezekiel 37.1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And then final reference, chapter 43 and verse 5, it says, So the spirit took me up and brought me to the inner court, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel filled the house. And so you get this constant repetition, spirit lifted me up, took me up. And so, again, here's a, a man, by the way, the Holy Spirit is mentioned in connection with Ezekiel more than any other person in the Old Testament. He is prim, prim, primarily the prophet of the Holy Spirit. So Ezekiel stands obediently before the Lord, listens to his word, and God is strengthening him for the task that he is about to give to him. So the Spirit entered into me, again back in verse 2, when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. And so prophet is strengthened. Now the prophet is sent. We notice this in verses 3 through 5. He said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation, that hath rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me even to this very day. So Ezekiel was sent to Israel to speak God's words, not his own. So notice that he's not going to give him his own opinions, his own thoughts. I send thee to the children of Israel, rebellious people. Uh, he, he, he's going to deliver God's words to them. Uh, it's not about what Ezekiel liked or did not like. It was about being God's messenger. And it's true for every one of us today, whether an elder, evangelist, a Bible teacher, brother in the meeting, uh, we need to be make sure that we're those that communicate God's word and not our own ideas, our own thoughts, our own opinions. Our opinions are worthless. What What does God say about these things? And so this is what he's been sent to do, uh, to give God's message. So he says, Son of me, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me, for they are impotent children. Uh, verse 4, stiff-hearted, I do send thee unto them, thou shalt say, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, and they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear for their rebellious house, that shall know that there's been a prophet amongst them. So the message is, give them my word. Uh, thus saith the Lord. Present a thus saith the Lord message to them. Now his task was not going to be an easy one. Right at the start, he's been told of the hardship of his office. He's been sent to a people who are in rebellion. They've rebelled against God <laughs> from the very beginning. And so what a, what a challenging thing to do this. Similar to Paul in Acts chapter 9, right at the beginning of his call, he's been told of the difficulty of his office. Acts 9, 16, he says to him, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So, very difficult task. And, you know, sometimes it's it's hard to persevere when there's very little response from the people you're speaking to. 
it's a challenge and it really is very easy to get discouraged and, and give up and quit. It's kind of interesting that biography I read several years ago of Charles Simeon, and he was called to the Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge. And on the very day that he arrived, there was a group within the church who didn't want him. And they actually changed the locks so he couldn't even get into the building. I mean, they, you know, but he, throughout his ministry there, 54 years, there was opposition towards his ministry throughout the whole time. And yet God blessed his ministry tremendously. <laughs> but it was in the face of great opposition. And sometimes it's very difficult, very challenging to be in that situation. And so he, it was a desperate situation. And of course, it's very hard for all of us to deal with this kind of thing. And we, we see that with others. Uh, we, it's interesting how Jeremiah was so discouraged, he, he was ready to quit uh, because of the difficulty of his mission. He wanted to kind of resign his commission and throw in the towel. And as it were, the Lord picked it up and threw it back to him because God's word was burning within him and he couldn't stop from speaking. But what a challenge it is to be in this situation where you're speaking against the people who are rebellious. Nothing is harder for the servant than not to see results for his labors. How do we compare with Ezekiel? Do we persevere in gospel testimony when there's no visible results? See, that's a challenge, isn't it? This is where it becomes practical. Now, of course, we want to pray. We don't want to settle for, oh, that's the way it is. We need to pray that the Lord might bring results and bring blessing. But we don't want to quit. I was telling somebody recently about an assembly I know personally in Northern Ireland and 10 years of Sunday night gospel services with no apparent results. The Christians were deeply excised, and they were, they'd were they been inviting people, they'd been praying, but no blessing, 10 years. And so year 11, and I know a person in that fellowship, he told me, he said, every Sunday night, year 11, somebody was saved in that hall. Imagine if they'd quit year 10. <laughs> they'd have missed tremendous blessing. Sometimes we just have got to persevere despite discouragement, despite opposition, despite lack of apparent results. We need to just do the right thing, what God has called us to do. So we find that here. He was sent to a rebellious nation. Now, it's interesting that the Hebrew word nation here is the word goy, from which we get goyim, or a term that's usually used of the Gentiles. Okay? And so what's interesting is, Israel and now being referred to as a rebellious nation, just like the Gentiles. And of course, what, what the reason is obvious. Israel had lived like the heathen nations. They had worshipped the gods of the heathen. They had committed the abominations of the heathen. The very sins that had caused the land to vomit out the Canaanites in Leviticus 18.25 now caused his rebellious nation to be vomited out because God is no respecter of persons. And so he's, he's entirely consistent. What God had done, Leviticus 18, 25, um, we, we, he says, the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity there upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Well, the very same thing that had happened to the the Gentile nations in the land of Canaan, now it happened to the land of Israel because they had basically out the Canaanites. And God has to be consistent towards his character. And so Israel were hard of face and hard of heart. This is their character. This is the people he sent to. Um, Impotent children, stiff-hearted. Uh, what a commission to be sent to people like this. More than a dozen times, they are called a rebellious house or a house of rebellion rather than the house of Israel. Seven times in this chapter, God refers to them as rebellious. Amazing. They're just a bunch of rebels. 
Um, and of course, seven times the number of completeness and fullness. They they are fully and completely rebellious. That's the idea. That's why it referred to seven times in this very chapter. And of course, the character of the people to be impotent and stiff-necked, a description which God had applied to them ever since the days of Moses. In fact, let's go back again to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32 and verse 9, where we read this, Exodus 32, verse 9, he says, And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Remember we said that stiff neck, you have a stiff neck, it's hard to bow. And they're 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 determined not to bow to the to the crown rights of the Lord. <laughs> they just don't want to do it. And that's where they're at. They're just rebels. They're determined not to bow. And so this is their problem. Uh, Stiff-hearted, stubbornly resistant. And so in this book, it's kind of interesting that God's judgment begins at the house of God. He's going to deal the first few chapters before he deals with judgment on the Gentile nations. He starts right with the house of God. He starts right with the the people of God. And that's, of course, consistent. First Peter 4, 7, a judgment must first begin at the house of God. They're showing an attitude which marked their fathers before them and which had continued to this very day. They had failed to learn from the past dealings of God, bent on going their own way. No wonder that in a coming day, Israel will confess and this is a day when they look on him who they pierce. They're going to say this, all we like sheep have gone astray. <laughs> we have turned everyone to his own way. And of course, that is exactly how they have been. And yet notice he says, whether they will hear, verse 5, or whether they'll forbear for their rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them of course they're going to know that he was god's prophet how are they going to know he's god's prophet because a true prophet of god what he says does come to pass and when we get to ezekiel chapter 33 he's going to prophesy that they, there were still many of them felt that they were going to be soon going back to to the land and that because there was still Jerusalem, the temple was still standing as he begins his ministry. They felt like God was never going to allow his temple to be destroyed. And so when word comes in Ezekiel 33 about the destruction of the of the of the city of Jerusalem, that the world that the city was destroyed, then they would know that a prophet had been amongst them. And so uh, he speaks what he speaks will come to pass telling the truth that he is indeed from God, and they'll know that a true prophet has been among them. Look at chapter 33 and verse 33, just to show that this is coming to a conclusion uh, that his prophecies are true. It says, verse 33, when this comes to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. And of course, uh, verse 21 is when it comes to pass. It says, it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity in the 10th month, the fifth day of the month, that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me saying, the city is smitten. So his early prophecies all come true, proving that he is a prophet of God and they will know that a prophet has been amongst them. Now, chapter 6 and verse 7 it says this, and the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, it's kind of a bit of a parallelism here. But not only are they going to know that there's been a prophet amongst them, but at the same time, they're going to know that he, the one who appeared on this throne, is the Lord. They're going to know that. And that's going to be repeated throughout the book. They'll know that I am the Lord. It's going to be repeated frequently. So, uh, the prophet then is to shun fear in verse 6 and 7. It says, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, 
and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. So he's told three times in this little section, don't be afraid. Verse 6, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words. So three times this repetition, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of their words. It mentions that twice. And of course, not only don't be afraid of their words, but notice verse 7, speak my words. Thou shalt speak my words. Don't be afraid of what they say, but you say what I'm telling you. You speak my words. So great emphasis on words here. Don't be afraid of their words, but speak my words. Now he talks about these people. He says, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. What a description. It represents briars and thorns, that which is unyielding, and piercing. I don't know if you ever tried to walk and you get caught up in a thicket of briars and they just don't want to let go. They're they're unyielding. They won't give up. And they're also very prickly. And then, of course, he goes on and says, not only are they like briars and thorns, but uh, you dwell among scorpions. Uh, they've got a sting in their tail. Uh, so what a description of this is the, the people of God. This is the, the, the house of Israel that is being described this way. And so uh, referring to the levels, the different degrees of resistance to the truth of God. Some of them are unyielding. They're just not going to budge. Others are piercing in their accusations, their words. Others, they have a terrible sting in what they say. The people are thorny or prickly, a sting in their tail, don't be afraid of them, he says. Remember in Judges chapter 9, the bramble bush, a rebel seeking a place? Uh, that, that's an amazing chapter. And then, of course, the seed sown among thorns, choking the word of God. And he talks about them being like thorns and briars. And so sometimes the rejection of a message is seen also in a look of disdain or a proud defiance. And so notice he says, not only don't be afraid of their words, nor be dismayed, end of verse 6, at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Don't be dismayed here. Uh, don't be shattered by their, their looks. Uh, and so, again, what a difficulty. Th these people are just, they're unyielding, they're, they, they're, they're, they're really prickly people. Uh, their, their looks are defiant. What a challenge. And so how do you deal with this? Well, again, we have to say that the ability to deal with such opposition comes from the Spirit of God. So Paul would say to Timothy, New Testament application, 2 Timothy 1.7, he talks about... God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And of course, the spirit of God is the one who enables us to continue despite this kind of opposition. And so the, the power says Paul is balanced, of course, by love and a sound mind. Message of judgment almost always must be given in love. And again, that love comes from the spirit of God. So this is his, his difficulty against a rebellious people. And the message must be given whether they accept it or reject it. What's required of the prophet is to deliver God's message. That's his responsibility. He, he can't be responsible for the results. He's responsible for delivering the message. We need to recognize that too. Our responsibility, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. We, we can't affect the results. We just have to faithfully give God's message and trust him that he will use his word through his spirit to bring the necessary results. But we can't do that. It has to be a work that God does. 
But of course, these people there, rebels, and of course, rebellion is not a happy way to live and a happy way to end. And of course, we're going to see as we move on through Ezekiel, our time has gone this morning, but as we move on through Ezekiel, we're going to see that the way of the transgressor is hard. You never see a happy rebel. They're the most miserable people. And that's kind of his message is to a bunch of rebels. Of course, he's been told, don't later on, he's going to be told in this very chapter, don't be like them. <laughs> you give my message, but you don't be like them. You've got to be different. You don't be a rebel yourself, Ezekiel. You be in submission to me. But our time is gone. We'll have to take up those things as we continue next time in the will of the Lord. Amen. <laughs>